But I had the courage to do it in spite of that fear because I believed that it would lead to my ultimate success. And when I, when I counsel entrepreneurs, which happens almost all the time, which is why I, I love doing shows like this, I, I'm often saying to them, oh, don't be fearless, but recognize your fear, embrace your fear, and then take action in the face of that fear. That's called courage. And that's what differentiates the successful, right? Fortune favors the bold. That's what differentiates the successful from, from those that frankly don't have the courage. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook Podcast, where we share inspiring startup stories with practical takeaways for you, the listener. Today's guest is best-selling author and serial entrepreneur, Dave Kirpin. He's founded companies such as Likeable, Apprentice, and Remembering Life. His latest book is called The Art of the People and was only recently released. On top of this, he's built a huge audience on social media, and he's got nearly 700,000 followers on LinkedIn. You'll be able to tell from his interview that Dave is also a speaker at global events across the world, and I'm sure you'll be entertained by what he has to say today. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to Entrepreneur's Handbook, Dave. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. You've got a really varied background and you've done so many different things. And I'm sure what the audience would love to know is like, where did it all start from? What was the first thing that got you into entrepreneurship? Sure. So uh, I wanted to be a teacher uh, from the time I was in first grade all the way through probably junior year of college. But I had this crazy college experience that led me towards entrepreneurship while I was in school in Boston. I took a job working as a ballpark vendor, uh, working at baseball games and uh, basketball and hockey games uh, in Boston. And uh, two things about the, the vending system. It's a seniority based system. So you have to work for years to sell the good products and it's commission only. So you want you you, you know, you got to put in the time to sell the hot dogs and the beer, which is where you make the real money. So my first day on the job, I had a product called Crunch and Munch. It was the worst selling product in the building. And I sold six boxes. And I came back and I, I made the legal minimum $10 that they could pay me. And I came back the second day thinking, it's fun to be at the ballpark, but I'd like to actually make a good living. Developed a shtick, singing, dancing, juggling boxes uh, in order to sell more product. And long story short, was able to create a uh, sort of local celebrity type status and sell quite a, quite a bit of Crunch and Munch. At, at my best, I was making about $1,000 a night. So for a college student, obviously a very good living. And that really, it made me fall in love with marketing, sales, PR, and entrepreneurship, because to a great extent, ballpark vendors are uh, essentially entrepreneurs, many entrepreneurs working within the system. Fast forward to a couple years later, when I married my, uh, my wife, uh, we couldn't afford uh, the giant wedding that we wanted, <laughs> that I wanted. And my wife had this brilliant idea to get married at a baseball stadium and uh, create a sponsored promotion around the wedding and sell sponsorships to all of our wedding vendors. And so uh, we we pitched a minor league affiliate of the Mets, the Brooklyn Cyclones, and they uh, said yes. The, the, the general manager said, this is the craziest idea I've ever been pitched, and I've been pitched a lot of crazy ideas, but I somehow think you guys can pull it off. And we did. 1-800-Flowers.com sponsored our flowers. Smanoff sponsored our alcohol. David's Bridal sponsored our wedding dresses, and so on and so forth. We raised about $100,000 for an amazing wedding, got married in front of 500 friends and family, basically everyone we knew, and um, about 5,000 baseball fans at the end of the game. And the event generated massive, massive publicity. We were on every TV network, thousands of blogs, which back in 2003 was the was what social media consisted of. And literally after the wedding, our vendors, including 1-800-Flowers and Entenmann's, who had sponsored our desserts, they said, this was amazing. What are you guys going to do next? We couldn't get married again. So we started uh, our first company together. And that's when I officially, I guess, became an entrepreneur. Yeah. And you had that idea to do the dancing and singing with uh, Crunch and Munch. Did you always have that confidence? Or is it something which you decided to do and you put yourself out there because you wanted to earn more money? Or did you always have that kind of aura about you to do that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good question. And it's funny because uh, sometimes when I tell that story, uh, and I didn't this time, but sometimes I will joke about how I had zero talent, 
But what I, which is true, I really, I can't sing or dance, but what I did have that made it work was the courage. And I use the word courage specifically because sometimes people see that as uh, fearlessness, but it's not fearlessness. I mean, to be clear, I was terrified of being, being looking like a fool and I did look like a fool sometimes, but I had the courage to do it in spite of that fear because I believed that it would lead to my ultimate success. And so I think it's that uh, courage, I would call it more courage than confidence, that, that ultimately helped me to become successful in this case. And so, and when I, when I counsel entrepreneurs, which happens almost all the time, which is why I, I love doing shows like this, I, I'm often saying to them, oh, don't be fearless, but recognize your fear, embrace your fear, and then take action in the face of that fear. That's called courage. And that's what differentiates the successful, right? Fortune favors the bold. That's what differentiates the successful from, from those that, frankly, don't have the courage. How do you think that courage helped you when you start setting up Life Will Media? Well, again, it's a matter of taking calculated risks. So I'll take you back to that first, the first uh, couple of months with Likeable. So uh, we, you know, it didn't go from getting married at a baseball stadium to building a business overnight. Uh, I was a teacher at the time. I told you I had studied uh, education and wanted to become a teacher. I was a teacher at the time because I skipped the whole reality TV part. We can come back to that later if we want, but it's, I, don't, I don't know how relevant it is. But I was a teacher at the time, and uh, we, we had those first couple clients, and um, I had a conversation with my wife, who, who at the time had a um, baby from her first marriage. And so we said to ourselves, look, we see some really great opportunity here, but let's make sure that we have something. And so I'm going to, Dave, Dave, you're going to work for the summer because teachers have summers off. And I needed to generate at least $5,000 a month of revenue, recurring revenue, in order to know, okay, we're going to take the leap now. And I'm going to quit teaching and we're going to sort of build this business full time. So I don't know if I would call it courage. I, this I would call more um, uh, persistence and drive. And, um, but I banged the phones and I, and I, and I dug up leads and I, and I pit, made a lot of pitches and, you know, it only took a few weeks to get to that $5,000 a month revenue number that allowed us to then take more calculated risks. She, I left teaching. She left her job a, a, a few months later, and then we were able to continue to, to grow, uh, to grow likable, um, you know, from there. What do you think enabled you to get those first few clients when, you didn't have a background in that. You're a teacher. How did you convince those early people to come on board? To be fair, before teaching, I had worked in sales, uh, I had radio sales. I had built up some relationships. And, and I do think one thing I know very, very well, which I didn't study in school, but I fortunately have picked this up along the way, is, is, is marketing, brand marketing, stay, helping companies stand out. And so uh, I... I one thing that my wife and I were very good at from the start was building rapport and turning problems and challenges into ideas and being creative right away. We had the opportunity, of course, back then we had the knowledge that that uh, that we, we, we had the case study of the wedding to sell to people and people were blown away by the wedding story. So they thought, wow, if they were that creative for themselves, what can they do for me? So I think we had that. Um, and I had the ability to listen. I think so much of sales is listening, asking good questions, and then shutting up and just listening to the person at the other end, share their issues, share their problems, share their challenges, and then help them feel heard. And once they feel heard, it's, 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 it's really easy to then say, hey, I have an idea. Maybe this can help. Oh, okay, great. And all of a sudden, we had sales and we had we had some big clients. And then it takes some luck and it takes some innovation and creativity. You know, we started off, we weren't likable. We were the K-Buzz and we weren't doing social media. We were doing uh, guerrilla marketing, promotions, uh, events, things like baseball stadium events, right? Because that's what we had done for, for our wedding. And I was doing a, a word of mouth marketing, a party program for Verizon. Verizon was one of our first clients. And they had something called Verizon Fios cable service that they were introducing. And they wanted us to do house parties 
for people with Verizon to invite their friends and then spread the word about Verizon. And so we were organizing this pretty straightforward, easy program to execute. And one of my interns said, you know, Dave, there's this uh, new social network that just opened up uh, beyond college students called Facebook. And I think you should join. And I was like, okay, sure. Set up a profile for me. Um, well, a couple of days later, I realized, wow, this Facebook is really amazing. And I said, well, let's, what if we use Facebook to build, to find people who have Verizon to, for, the, for our party program? And within like two hours of me posting on Facebook for this house party program for Verizon, I had thousands of, of applicants. And I immediately realized, wow, this is a much better way to do word of mouth marketing than baseball stadium events and mall events and the guerrilla marketing that we've been doing. And we were very fortunate to be very early on in the social media space for brands. We ended up launching the Verizon Facebook page and the 100 Flowers Facebook page and all these other uh, big brands uh, uh, presence. But it all started with courage to make the phone calls, building rapport, listening well, and then sharing some ideas. I also imagine it must have been really difficult because you said that your wife had a young child from her first marriage. So working with your wife on the business at the same time as trying to raise a young child. How did you manage that dynamic? It was very, very hard. And uh, we probably, you know, she's she's done one book and I've done five now. We probably have a book in us together at some point about building a business with a spouse or with a family member because I'm, I'm, I'm often asked, how in the heck do you do that? I could never do that. Um, I think ultimately there are challenges, but it's kind of the best. I tell people that, now, starting a business and building a business without a partner is very, very hard. So let's let's assume that you have to have a partner. Well, you can either have a partner that has a complementary skill set, or you can have a partner that you're already essentially partnered with for the rest of your life in, in, in a spouse. So for me, despite the challenges that I'll walk through in a moment, the ability to have a partner that I so inherently trust with my life, for the rest of my life, I've taken vows. Um, it's the best thing in the world. It's the best thing in the world. Now, challenges, communication, boundaries, not taking work home, not taking home to work. Really, really important. Took a lot of practice. Took a lot of over communication. Took a lot. To, we some some uh, uh, couples therapy. You know, uh, it took a lot of hard, hard work. But once we set boundaries, we set up really strong communication, we set up strong roles, um, you know, best de- after marrying her, best decision of my life. <laughs> yeah, because it's amazing how much like will then went on to grow and you then like, transitioned to become the chairman as well. Yeah, became chairman and then we sold the company last year. So uh, that was, you know, for a lot of entrepreneurs, of course, that's the ultimate we didn't we, we the, the, the crazy thing was we built the company we started the company because we saw the opportunity and we wanted more flexibility and time with our our child and as we as we started to grow we realized we had something bigger and i think my entrepreneurship and my wife's growing entrepreneurship at the time helped us get to a point where we were looking at scale and growth and repeatability and and all these sorts of things which most agencies don't don't do, frankly, but we were fortunately able to do it. We built a recurring revenue model. We built a content as a credit system. It was, so we were selling deliverables instead of selling time. And we were able to scale and, and, and eventually exit uh, last year with, with a wonderful multiple. When did you start getting the idea about having an exit? Because obviously you're working with Likeable for a long time and it's your baby in a way, right? It came at the same time just after your marriage. Was it hard to let go? Yes, all, all yes, 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 and yes. Um, so like I said, it started off as more of a lifestyle business for some flexibility. And then we realized we had something here, we were growing. And at the time, um, we, 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 social media was exploding. And so we had friends who built companies uh, like uh, Mike, Laz- Mike and Cass Lazaro built a company called Buddy Media that they exited to Salesforce for very, very nice multiple. And uh, v- Victoria Ransom uh, and, and her husband built a company called Wildfire App that they sold to Google for a very nice sum. And so just because we were doing social media, we actually got lots of inquiries from 
uh, would be buyers and would be investors uh, through the years. So then we started thinking, huh, wow, we're building something of greater value. And then I think eventually we decided, my wife and I, we meet every, we meet um, once a year, we have a, a, a business retreat. Uh, and so, of course, we talk about other things, but we're sort of focused on what, where are we with our businesses, with our ideas, with our growth, with our plans, with our big long-term strategy. And it was the end of 2019 that we decided, okay, we're ready, we're ready to sell this thing. So we're going to spend the next year getting the business in order, and we're going to sell the business at the end of uh, 2020. So obviously COVID hit, but our business was, you know, and at this point, my wife was really running the business. I was the chairman, as you mentioned, she was, she was CEO running the business. Business was, had, had, a, had a fantastic year and more important, we got our, um, we got our books in order and, and, and everything in order to be able to sell it. And so the end of 2020 came and we had our str uh, annual strategic retreat and we said, so are we doing this? I said, yeah, we're going to do this. And um, we, we, we made the decision and we hired a broker to help us uh, in January of 2021. And by April, the business had, was, had sold. We got three offers and sold the business in, um, in less than three months, which is really remarkable. It doesn't usually happen that fast. But for us, we were very fortunate. I think one thing people listening are probably going to be thinking about is how to know how to like, price your business. Like, how do you know what's the right number that you're willing to let go for? Like, how did you do those discussions? And obviously, it's difficult as well because there's two of you. Yeah, I think a lot has to do with um, knowing what your goals are overall and knowing what your needs are overall. So, um, so when we first started the business, our goals weren't to sell a business or even to build a business. Our goals were to have time, to have enough money and have freedom to, 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 to have the sort of family time that we wanted. And then... As the business grew, our goals changed and we realized, oh, now we want to make X amount of dollars as income. Um, and then eventually we decided, OK, we, we're ready to exit if we can generate this amount of money. And if we can't, OK, we'll keep building the business, which is OK, too. Right. So it, it, it really comes down to um, goals. And, we're, you know, when I talked about earlier in terms of communication, especially when you have a partner, and especially when your partner is your is your spouse, it's it's lots and lots of communication and making sure that you're aligned because because we weren't always aligned on these things. Right. So, like, I wanted to build a bigger business um, faster, accelerate more. And eventually we agreed, OK, Dave. Dave, I, I will um, I will start another business that I can accelerate. Right. And, and raise money for it. And Carrie can focus on on, on on likable. And that's fine, right? So it's, it's it's all about goals and communication. So obviously you have started up multiple businesses and Apprentice is one that's particularly interesting. Can you tell people about Apprentice and what it does? Yeah, I, I of course, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, so so this business came about because so I first, uh, let me, I'll, I'll briefly mention that I, to your point, I started a couple other businesses Um which have had various amounts of success. But along the way, through Likeable, through Likeable Local, through UMA, few, uh, the last 13, 14 years that I've been an entrepreneur, I always would hire college students who would work for me as my assistants, and then I would teach them. And they were so smart and driven that uh, it really worked for me. Then I would often hire them after they graduated full time and they would come on and immediately have big roles because they were smart, they were driven and they had learned how to work with me and I had molded them perfectly. So they would come on, they would co-author books with me. They would run marketing for me. They would be my chief of staff. They would uh, help me fundraise really, you know, important roles. And Rob was one such student that worked for me for a couple of years and Worked for me when he was a, 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 a sophomore and junior, came to me at the end of junior year and he said, Dave, I think this whole idea of college students working for entrepreneurs, there's a business model here. Because you've taught me more than I, I learned in school. 
And I know I've done a lot of really valuable work for you. I mean, he had he had he had run a million dollar a project for me. He had co-authored a book with me. He was like a brilliant kid. And I said, yeah, Rob, you're totally right. And within three weeks, we had gone into business with each other. And uh, I named it Apprentice, which I know has uh, some connotations, but fine. Uh, I, I, we love the name. And, um, and Rob, to his credit, uh, negotiated 50-50 and co-CEO with me. So he became co-CEO and, and co-founder, 50-50 partner at the age of uh, 20. And now, a couple of years later, he's got a he's got a, a, a multi million dollar business because we've been fortunate; it's grown very quickly. So the idea is that we uh, are a managed marketplace that connects uh, entrepreneurs and startup execs with the best and brightest college students on the planet. These are kids that I shouldn't call them kids. These are people that, within a couple of years, they're going to be working for McKinsey. And the top consulting firms, and I was stunned to learn this recently. But Amar, these these McKinsey, the average the average engagement for McKinsey is over a million dollars. So big companies are paying McKinsey a million bucks, and guess who's doing the work? These college students. These, these, the, my apprentices. Two years later, these Ivy League kids that are super smart, they're doing the work. The vast majority of the work. So I said, what if what if I could charge startups that don't want to pay a McKinsey a million dollars? What if I could charge them a small fraction of that and assign my apprentices to help solve their biggest problems in sales and marketing and biz dev and operations in data and analytics? And it turns out it, it turns out it's a very, very good model. So I'm super uh, I'm super excited about it. I am uh, the the oldest person at the company by you know a solid twenty twenty years, but that's okay. I, it keeps me uh, keeps me young and energetic to be working with such brilliant brilliant uh, young people, uh, and they're so driven. And I'm really excited because you know Likeable was a wonderful uh, outcome. Um, that said, I think Apprentice, you know, we can add a couple zeros and help a lot more people. Our big big long term vision is to mentor at least a million people. So. Uh, the only way we're going to mentor a million people is by lots of uh, engagement. So we, we, you know, look looking forward to that growth. Yeah, it's, even just saying that, I'm thinking about because my background is I used to be a consultant, and it's exactly what you said, right? Like I, kn- I know what my day rate was versus what I was paid, and there's a big difference, right? And you see that for many people who come out of university, it's like I majored in economics, so there's all that background, and then you go into the big companies, you can do something different. So I think there's a lot of people listening who may be a bit on the younger side who are thinking, wait, this is a model that can work for me. Why do I have to go to one of these big companies where I'm going to be doing all the hard work? And let's face it, most consultants are working all around the clock when actually they've got a lot of the value themselves. That's and right. They need the babysitting. That's right. If you're if you're listening and you're working for the man right now, um, I, I challenge you to have the courage to uh, to see that you are valuable and capable and can absolutely build your own thing, um, and so and if you're on the fence, the, the best time to do it, you know, it gets harder and harder. You, anyone can become an entrepreneur for sure, but it gets harder and harder. You know, it, it was that we when we had a child with with healthcare to think about and a mortgage, you know, that's harder risk to manage than when you're a young person with no kids and no mortgage. It's just, it's just a reality. So it only gets harder. And so now the, I would just say the time is now. And by the way, I do office hours with anyone on the planet that ever wants to chat with me. You go to scheduledave.com and every Thursday I meet with who literally anyone on the planet that wants to chat with me. And I, I'm happy to coach them about you know business ideas that they may have. One thing I'm interested in as well is a lot of people in your position wouldn't necessarily risk taking on college students. And you have all this problem of people trying to look at people who have such credentials. What was it that made you trust college students to begin with and go down this path of having these apprentices who you could mentor? Was it the teaching background? Did that have an effect on it? I think I love mentorship. And I think I love the ability to uh, mold people. And, you know, I don't want to come across as ageist. I've had some wonderful, wonderful people that have worked for me of all ages. I really have. But the real and the reality is that the older we get, 
and and the experience is not always an asset. It, it, it is both an asset and a liability because we learn a certain way of doing things. And then it's very, very hard to unlearn that. So for me as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a manager, I like to have a blank slate with people that I can truly mentor them and mold them into rock stars. And I, I've been able to get that with college students. And in the reverse, what are some of the lessons you've learned from some of those college students? What have they taught you and made you think about something differently? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad. You know, that that's such a good question that people that are watching, you know, would think that I teed you up for it, which I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I'm proudest of with Apprentice is our core values. And uh, our core, core values are mentorship, grit, and uh, being enterprising. And what I love about our core value statement around mentorship is that mentorship is bi-directional. We are all students and we are all teachers. And so I am delighted to be able to mentor our apprentices and teach them lots of stuff. But to your point, I learn so much every day from our apprentices. I'll give you a perfect example. You know, several years ago, I wrote a New York Times bestselling book on social media called Likeable Social Media. Uh, I sold a ton of books. I'm very, very fortunate. But years later, I tell you, I don't know a thing about TikTok. I mean, I am a, I was a TikTok moron. And thank goodness for my apprentices teaching me how the heck to use TikTok, because otherwise, it's like such a different... Um, way of thinking about social media. And the reality is the world changes fast. The world, the, the speed of the acceleration of technology and of change now is greater than ever before. So I think the, the winners will be those who realize like Socrates, the older he got, the less he knew. I, I, I know now how little I know. I don't know Jack. And so thank goodness I surround myself with really, really smart apprentices who teach me every single day about stuff like TikTok and Snapchat. You mentioned the New York Times bestselling book as well. And I think you said you had five books now. And you've co with some of them with your apprentices as well. And like, was it always the idea in your head that you wanted to write multiple books? Or where has this come from? No, uh, I, I uh, really lucked out uh, because with my first book, so I always thought, you know, hey, I'd love to write a book one day. And I think, you know, if you polled a hundred entrepreneurs that probably 99 of them would say, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'd love to write a book one day, but they don't necessarily. And I certainly didn't necessarily have the drive to actually do it. So many other things to do, problems to solve, businesses to build, et cetera. But uh, because we were for fortunate enough to be early in the social media space, we got some, uh, some inbound interest from uh, McGraw Hill uh, to write, you know, one of the early social media books. And so they reached out. I said, sure. Uh, somebody insisted I get a literary agent. I said, fine. We negotiated a deal. And then I, I had that first book. And as I was doing the rounds with likable social media, the speaking gigs, the webinars, et cetera, I realized, holy cow, these principles of likability that I am talking about and writing about, uh, the things that make you successful in social media, listening, being authentic, being transparent, uh, being grateful, being responsive. These aren't just traits uh, of what makes a successful social media presence. These are traits that what makes a, a successful entrepreneur, in my opinion. So then I, I had to write my next book, Likeable Business, which was about uh, building, a, uh, uh, you know, building a great business. Uh, by the way, nobody read that book uh, because it had a very bad cover, and I learned that everyone does, in fact, judge a book by judge a book by its cover. But it, it's my best book, objectively speaking, in terms of the reviews. It's actually my best book, but nobody's read it. Um, I did likable leadership. I did art of people, which is again an extension of um, this idea of of being likable, and it, it, it broadens it to really all people skills and building relationships of of all of all kinds. And then I finally did after six years. My kids said to me, Daddy, when are you going to write a book that we can read? So I finally wrote a, I took a total uh, break from the previous business books. And my, my fifth book was a, a children's book, a YA book that we just published called Normal uh, for, uh, for, 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 for kids, for middle grade kids, like uh, uh, 10 through uh, 9, 10 through 12. Uh, and then my next book, which I'm super excited about, is uh, going to be called Share. And it's about delegation. Uh, I believe that the single biggest thing that uh, 
differentiates good entrepreneurs from great entrepreneurs, good, a small business owner from somebody that's able to build something uh, uh, really scalable, sellable, meaningful is a, the ability to delegate. So many, so many folks are either uh, scared to delegate. They don't trust people. They don't, they, they want to do everything themselves. They need to do everything themselves or the opposite. They're micromanagers. They delegate and then they breathe down somebody's neck to get the job done perfectly the exact way. And I think there's a huge, huge gap and a lot, a lot of people that need, need the help to become better delegators. So that, that will be, uh, you know, my, my next one. There's a ton of interesting things you mentioned there. So I'm going to come back to some of those points as well. But what I want to start off with is, what do you think people often get wrong about likability? So obviously everybody wants to be likable, right? Nobody's trying to be, turn other people off. But I experience the same thing, right? I have a lot of people who, in my messages, they try to contact me and it's an instant turn off. The way they've gone about it, the way they've, like, it's quite clear that they want some transactional from me and they don't seem to really be listening. What mistakes do you see people make and people listening right now might make these mistakes that they should really correct? Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. And I think you hit the nail on the head um, because the biggest mistake people make is that they are, and, and I get it, I totally understand why, they are focused on themselves instead of the other person and they're selfish and they're thinking what can they get out of the relationship when in reality what works is the opposite, um, being other-centric. I'll tell you a story that's in the art of people. Um, as, as I'm building businesses and, and, and the books, et cetera, as I'm becoming more successful, I'm getting more and more inbound spam emails, et cetera, from salespeople. The two big categories, and I still get it, is financial planners and real estate guys. Nonstop, all day, every day, financial planners. Uh, I'm a wealth manager. I want to meet with you, blah, blah, blah. And, and real estate guys, let's talk. I'll get you a great space on your lease, next office, build your office, move your office, et cetera. And, and, it's, and it's crap. I mean, it's nonstop. Well, I got this email that I found very curious from a guy named Michael Kislin. He said, Dave, I'd love 15 minutes of your time. And I promise I won't sell you at all. I just want to understand how I can best help you. Oh, okay, fine. So he meets with me. I give him 15 minutes, comes in. At the time, uh, so he says to me, you know, hey, like I said, tell me a little bit about yourself and how I can help you. And I was fundraising at the time for my software startup. I mentioned this, I think, like of a local. And um, so I said, well, you know, if you can introduce me to investors, that'd be super helpful. I'm, 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 I'm fundraising right now, trying to do a seed round, et cetera. He said, okay, great. Happy to make, I'll make a couple of intros for you. And then I said, well, okay, great. And, and tell me a little bit about what you do and, and, and uh, how, you know, I can help you. And he said, absolutely not. That's not what I came here for. I promised I wouldn't sell you. I'm not going to sell you. So he introduced me to a couple of investors. And about nine months later, when I had some money, I knew that he was a financial planner. And I called him up. I said, hey, you know, I remember you. You were really helpful back then. Let's meet and let's talk about my money. Well, when I exited my company and I had real money last year, who, who do you think I gave my money to? And who have I given referrals to in the last, you know, seven years since that happened? Him. He's made, he's made a very nice living off of me. And why? Because he was truly, sincerely focused on me and helping me. So that's the single biggest mistake that we make because, of course, we're in our own bodies and minds all day long every day. So, of course, we're thinking about our own needs. But the secret to likability is being focused on the other person and how you can truly and sincerely help them. How have you used that tactic yourself? How have you tried to make sure that you do that in your own business? All the time. I'll give you an example. When I well, became a LinkedIn influencer, I realized I had a really good asset. I was going to be pitching Barbara Corcoran from uh, Shark Tank uh, to, to, to raise money. And I realized that she'd make a really good LinkedIn influencer. So I wrote to her and I said, hey, uh, I'm in the LinkedIn influencer program. It's been really valuable. And I think you'd make a really good LinkedIn influencer. Are you interested in an intro to their, to their head editor? She said, sure. I introduced them. 
I got Barbara into the LinkedIn influencer program. And then of course she took a meeting uh, to, to meet with me and has been a friend ever since. So it's about, it's, it was, it wasn't about what I could get from her. It was about what I could give to her. And, and look, the, the, the more successful somebody is, the hard, you know, the, the, the bigger they are, the harder it is to find out how you can help them. But I'll tell you what, I, when I lecture with college students, I use that same TikTok example. I say, um, there's CEOs out there right now, lots and lots of CEOs and, and investors and very, very successful people that have no clue how to use TikTok. And if you're, you're a college student, you probably understand how to use TikTok a lot better than they do. And you could literally reach out to almost anyone, cold outreach on LinkedIn and say, hey, if you have 15 minutes, I'd love to teach you how to use TikTok. I think it's a really important fundamental change in, in, in social communication and would be very helpful for how you think about your business. They'll probably take your call. So there you go. Pro tip for everyone listening. You mentioned there like you became a LinkedIn influencer. And it's a little bit of an understatement because you've got, what, nearly 700,000 followers now? How did you build that kind of audience? And what advice do you give to other people trying to do the same thing? Yeah. So two, the two big things are content, 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 lots and lots of creative uh, and helpful, valuable content, and, and specifically content that is most... Uh, the new, the newest content is always the content that, that, that social networks are going to prioritize in their algorithm. So when live video was introduced all over, be all over live video When stories is introduced, be all over stories right now. Newsletters are, are, are sort of the biggest content focus of LinkedIn. So you got to be sharing, writing and sharing newsletters. And then the second thing is leveling up who you write about an interview somebody that has more followers than you. So I would interview people like Barbara and people like Lori uh, Grenier at Shark Tank, people like Damon John, because they had more followers than I do. So when I interview them, same, same principle that folks use on podcasts, obviously, when you interview me for the Entrepreneur's Handbook, I'm going to share that with my audience, my whole 700,000 audience. So same thing, when you do content, if you can include people with lots of followers in your content, they're, they're going to be incentivized, natu naturally incentivized to share that content with their, their large followers. I want to come back to what you mentioned earlier about the new book coming out with Share and about how to delegate. And what mistakes did you make earlier on in your career with delegation? And how do you think you're a better delegator today? Yeah, uh, so... I've made a lot, a lot of mistakes about a lot of things. I will actually say one area where I've been very fortunate from the start is being a pretty good delegator. Um, so instead, I will just I will share. I apologize for sounding arrogant. I will share the most common mistakes that I see others make. That again, fortunately for me, it's not an issue I have. So, uh, so, 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 what mistakes do I see people making all the time? Uh, it's it's fear and distrust, and and they just don't think somebody's going to do the job as well as they could do it. And that could very well be true. But I would much, much rather have somebody get the job done at 90%, and I don't have to worry about it at all, than me have to do it at 100%. It's just, in the grand scheme of things, it's better to have things done than perfect, always, and tested, and learn. we learn, and we grow, we make mistakes, we keep going. Otherwise, people can't uh, people can't grow if we don't give them a chance to to, to make mistakes and, and to fail. Um, so th th that's that's the biggest that's the biggest thing is just fear and distrust and not letting uh, people do uh, people make mistakes and not letting people do it because they're not going to do it as well or the same way that uh, that you would do it or that, that that I would do it in this case. The one thing I, I guess that actually ironically, if you really want a mistake, sometimes what I will do is um, over delegate, delegate so much, I actually go in the opposite direction, which is probably not a problem that many people listeners have, but it is my problem. I'll delegate so much, I'll literally say, hey, go do this, figure it out, and I'm out of here. And then I, I won't give them as much guidance. So the thing with, 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 prop, with, with good delegation is, is we need to give the people that we're delegating to the, the appropriate uh, guidance and counsel to get there uh, along the way. So that that was a mistake that I, I, I made. And I, I tend to still make that once in a while. 
like somebody will start working for me and immediately I'll just assume they could literally do anything and um, and just sort of give them a huge, huge project. And then I'm like, oh, is that is that done? And they're like, I need a little bit more from you. I think a difficult line for many entrepreneurs is knowing that difference between when you need to give somebody a, a, like a more slack and let them be different versus when it's time to actually let them go. And I think a lot of people, especially earlier in their careers, they really struggle with the idea because nobody necessarily wants to be the person who fires other people. Yeah. So how, how do you balance that? How do you know when's the right time to give somebody more support and more investment versus actually maybe they're not right for this? Yeah, it's a great, great question. That, and and in, in, in mentoring and counseling thousands of entrepreneurs, I would say the single biggest challenge I see is folks that are, they, they don't fire people. Uh, uh, they don't fire people. Period. They certainly don't fire people fast enough, right? And so the the adage of hire slow, fire fast is really important. The the the, the I would say that hiring the 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 alternative to that is hire fast, fire fast. That's that's okay too, as long as you can in fact fire fast. Um, we all almost. I I've made this was a big big mistake I made, uh, and the reason we all make this mistake so much is we have cognitive dissonance. We want to believe that we've made the right decision in hiring someone. So our mind plays tricks on us over and over again. Oh, but they didn't know this. Oh, but, and we make excuses for them because we don't want to have failed in hiring them. So a couple things that help. First of all, we almost always know in our gut very early. If we know, if, if I know in my gut now that the person's not going to work out, I quickly make that call and coach them out quickly, period, end of story. I stop, I stop arguing myself over it because it almost never ends. All, all that does is extend the life an extra few months. The other really valuable thing around, again, coaching them out and letting them go is you, you, you're not doing anyone any favors to keep them in a job that's not working for them. In fact, you're holding them back. So the, the, the faster I fire someone, the faster that person can get to their true purpose. Maybe they're going to start another business. Maybe they're going to go start go in a different line of work. Maybe they're going to work for my competitor. It doesn't matter. But what matters is their dream is not with me. It's somewhere else. So I need to help them get to their dream faster. And with that other mentality, it's not, there's no more guilt. It's no, it's not, it's not a hard decision to make once I, once I can sort of think about it that way. Yeah. And it's like you said, where if they're not doing a very good job, it's unlikely that's a path for them because most people, at least at the beginning, that's when you're, you've got the honeymoon period, right? They should be really excited about what they're doing and trying to improve and trying to get better. And if you're not really seeing that from them, it probably means they're not very interested, but maybe they're just stuck or they don't want to leave themselves and That's then both right. of you are stuck in the position where you don't really want them there. They don't really want to be there, but neither of you want to be the person who fires or quits. So it just like carries along painfully. That's right. Not to mention the rest of the team. Every person I've ever let go, ever, the rest of the team is like, wow, thank goodness, finally. Yeah. Couldn't wait for that. Literally, every single time. And you're, and you're, and I'm like, wait, why didn't you tell me? Well, because nobody wants to be that person that sort of causes that. But it, but it's 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 always a net positive for for you, for the team, and for the individual. And that's the really shocking part. It's like we think we we, we think so much of ourselves that we think that we're going to crush somebody when we let them go. And the truth is, sometimes people are upset in the moment, but weeks later, months later. Oh my God, that's the, I'm so glad I, I've run into people that I fired uh, many times. Right. And it's like, oh my God, I'm so glad that that worked out because now I'm here. Now I'm there. Now I've moved on. You know, it's, it's always better for everyone. Yeah. And like coming towards the end of the interview now, what are you working on at the moment that really excites you? What's the most exciting thing that like is keeping like wakes you up in the morning now? Well, we talked about, we talked about, uh, we talked about share and we talked about apprentice and I am very excited about both of those things. Um, and particularly with apprentices growth, uh, mentoring more and more young people and helping more and more startups that can't, uh, pay for McKinsey actually have really smart people working on their biggest business problems. 
If I could choose one more thing that I hadn't talked about, we started a small uh, venture fund with some of the proceeds from our exit to invest in women and people of color entrepreneurs. And I'm excited about that. I, I love, you know, the only thing I love as much as entrepreneurship is investing and, and, and mentoring other entrepreneurs. So, so that's, that, that's pretty exciting as well. And then of course, totally not, totally not career wise, but my son plays baseball and it's the greatest thing coaching him. That that's an utter joy and excitement for me. And if people want to follow along this journey and find out more about you and what you're up to, where should they go to? What, what do they need to follow? Yeah, I'm, I'm at Dave Kirpin, K-E-R-P-E-N on all of the social networks. I even mentioned TikTok now. And so LinkedIn, connect. anyone that's listening can connect with me. Um, and if anyone wants to chat, like I said, office hours available for free for the public every Thursday, scheduledave.com. Perfect. Been a pleasure to chat today. Really enjoyed it. Thanks this. so much for having me again.